We'd like to first look at what we mean by those terms good and evil. Uh, and then really after that we're going to focus on what the Bible talks about um, when we consider those themes of good and evil. And hopefully by examining those themes within the Bible we will see then if it has uh, an impact on us or if we need to do something about uh, good and evil within our own lives. So hopefully there's something that we can all think about and take away perhaps from the talk this evening. When we look in the dictionary, for me it was a straight search on Google, but it was linked to the Oxford Dictionary, I looked for good, and there were a number of different definitions, but it can really be categorised into two areas, it's an adjective or it's a noun. So for example, it could be to be desired or approved of. For example, the play has good reviews, an adjective. It could have the required qualities of a, a high standard, so again, a, a good restaurant. Or possessing or displaying moral virtue, so for example, her father was a good man. So it can be used as an adjective to describe, but also it can be a noun, a, that which is morally right, for example, righteousness, to be a power for good, like a, a power to do a good thing. And obviously when we think about evil, it's, well, it's pretty much the opposite. But there is likewise an, an adjective and a noun. So a profoundly immoral and wicked is the adjective of evil. For example, his evil deeds, the deeds which he did which were evil. And also it's a noun, profound <coughs> immorality and wickedness. So the evil that took place last Thursday is an example. So actually, when we think about these terms, good and evil, they are used to describe an adjective, a person or a group and their actions or characteristics, perhaps. But it can also be used as a noun, as a force or a power for good or a force or a power for evil. And when I was beginning to put together some of these thoughts for this talk this evening, I asked myself the question, what do I think of? when considering good and evil. Clearly they, they are contrasts, they are opposed to each other. <coughs> On the simplest level, perhaps we may think of one being as right and the other being wrong. We may think of it in terms of actions, the things we do. So to do good, to help others perhaps, to give to charity. Or it might be to do evil, uh, things that may be wicked, for example, breaking the law. We might think of it in terms of a character, when someone is good, maybe in terms of personality. We might think of specific groups, or even perhaps specific countries that we may think of as good or evil. In fact, we're all fairly familiar with concepts, or the concept of good and evil. Uh, we're often brought up with them in books, myths and legends, television, in film. We have heroes and villains which represent good and evil in stories. And to some degree, we see this presented to us within the mainstream media. There's a, an ideal position, a good position, and there might be a not-so-ideal position, an evil position. Just let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Let's say I was to name a country, and you had to decide whether you thought it was a good or an evil country. Let's take North Korea at the moment, for example. I'm positive not many of us in the room have been there. But I'm sure you would agree it's presented, is it not, as an evil country due to its insular stand, its nuclear armament, and the threat it poses around the world to, to other countries. If we were to think about individuals, Hitler, for example, how would we view him? Perhaps Donald Trump, what would our view be on him? Sometimes when we consider good and evil, it's a matter of perspective. Our thoughts, our ideals are shaped by what we read and see and hear around us. And our judgments are based on those ideals which have been created in society. But let's go back to that example of North Korea. We might think, looking outward, that they are perhaps an evil country, but 
If you were from there, would you view it as evil? If you were a German, after the crushing defeat and the depression of the First World War, your view of your leader might be slightly different. If you are a Republican in the US, how would you view Donald Trump? Is it not a matter of perspective? To one, something viewed as good may be viewed as evil by another. In fact, is this not one of the main sources then that we have where conflict arises? Because to one person, one thing may be good, to another it is evil. And there's no balance between those two things. And so when we consider how good and evil can be viewed differently by others, what I would like us to focus on this evening, as our title suggests, is to consider what God thinks as good and evil, as revealed in his word, the Bible. So we will turn to God's message, the Bible. He has revealed his divine message within the pages. It is the only source of knowledge concerning God and his purpose. And the Bible is also very clear that there are certain things which are described as good and others as evil. And like the definitions we sort of read at the start, we will see that both adjective and noun for good and evil are used throughout the scriptures. And we have chosen to focus on these strands of good and evil, but often other contrasts are used within scripture to show and represent the same difference. So good and evil is encapsulated in, in other concepts too. Let me give you a couple of examples to prove what I'm talking about. In Job chapter 13 and verse 26, we see the words, it says, When I looked for good, then evil came unto me. And when I waited for light, there came darkness. Job 30 verse 26. You see how light and darkness there is equated with good and evil. Another verse in Isaiah chapter 5. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So again, contrasts used to share in this concept of good and evil. Darkness, light, bitter and sweet. Let's take a look now, if you would, at the first use of good within the scriptures then. It's in the first book, in the first chapter of Genesis, and at verse 4. We have here the first use of the word good in scripture. Uh, just use verse 3 for connection. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And so again, we have that contrast established between light and darkness. Light described as being good. And therefore, perhaps by inference, we can say darkness being the opposite of good. As there was a division between light and darkness. And as we go through this first chapter of Genesis, we see that good is used on a number of occasions to describe the days of creation. So in verse 10, verse 18, 21, 25, and at the very last verse, verse 31, we see God describes day six, the day in which man is created, as very good. God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And so we see from the outset, God viewed things as good or very good. Where then do we see the first use of evil in scripture? Well, we only need to turn over one page to Genesis in chapter 2. And it's in verse 8 or 9, 9. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, 
and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And there it is, the first use of the word evil used in connection with good. We have the tree here described as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Some of us may be familiar with the account here in Genesis, but it does as well just to remind us of what takes place. So in verse 16 and 17, we see the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. They were forbidden to partake of the fruit of this tree. And then as we go into chapter 3, we know that the woman is first deceived by the serpent, and then Adam, her husband, also partakes of the food. So verse 3 of chapter 3. She relays that message of God, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also to her husband. And so this is what's typically described as the fall in Eden. Adam and Eve partook, they disobeyed God's command and ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What were the consequences of their actions? Well, finally, just come to the end of the chapter. First of all, in verse 19, we see it says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and to dust shalt thou return. There was a sentence of death passed upon all men and women afterwards. But also, verse 22, we see it says, The Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. And this was the consequence. Man is become as one of us to know good and evil. This was part of the fall of the curse in the Garden of Eden. There was a knowledge now of what was good and evil. And this was obtained by every man and woman after this incident because of this, the disobedience here in the Garden of Eden. And so as a result, as we've just alluded to, each human ever since is born with this tendency towards evil, with that knowledge of evil. It's a term that we might see in scripture which is used for sin. And there's a, a reference in Romans in chapter 5 which describes a little about this. Incident. It says, wherefore, as by one man, in reference to Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5 and verse 12. This knowledge of good and evil has passed on to all men, and has caused each man and woman to sin, which has led to death. It is this evil which separates man from God. Now that would seem very bleak, wouldn't it, as a, an outset there. But the Bible is filled with examples of those who, yes, have sinned and at some point followed evil, but chose to pursue good to follow God and to obey his commandments. And in fact, this choice, this decision that individuals have to either follow good or follow evil is throughout the scriptures, both in the Old Testament and the New. I'd like to share with you a couple of examples. Turn with me to Deuteronomy and chapter 30.
So here in Deuteronomy chapter 30, God is speaking to his nation, Israel, the people of that nation. A bit of context, verse 5 says, The Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it. So it's talking about Israel going into their land. And then we pick up the verse, verse 15, it says, See, I have set before thee this day life and good, and death and evil. In that day I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgment, that thou mayest live and multiply. We could say that's good. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to possess it. And that's the contrast. Life and good, evil and death. This was given to the children of Israel as they were to enter into the land. To love the Lord, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, or to turn away and to worship other gods. And that was the choice that they were given. What about in the New Testament? Well, the Lord Jesus offers a similar choice but does so by picking up on the other contrast that we've highlighted of light and darkness. Come with me to John and chapter 3. So in John chapter 3, starting at verse 16... We see that it's talking about God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we see that similar theme being developed, life and perishing. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. So we see the similarity between these verses here in John and in Deuteronomy. But Let's go on a little bit further, verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the condemnation. That light is come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. We see that idea that men's natural deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deed should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest. So we're presented here with light and darkness. <clears throat> the contrast between them and the way that can be followed. And then just turn over a couple of pages, because Jesus then picks up these words to John in chapter 8. And develops this contrast with one other little verse to pick up. John 8 and verse 12 says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Again, that's the contrast. To follow Jesus, to have light, or to not. To walk in in darkness that same theme being developed through the scripture good evil light and darkness and that clear choice once again to follow one of those paths and so we've seen from deuteronomy that doing good was to love the lord thy god and to walk in his ways and keep his commandments we've seen that belief in the lord jesus and walking in light and following his example speaks to us also of doing good. And so we may logically ask the question, what does that really mean to us? What is required of us? 
Well, perhaps when we consider the life of the Lord Jesus and his own example, the one that we are asked to follow, that will provide us with the answer. So come to 1 Peter and chapter 2. Let's consider what this example is that we should be striving to follow. <clears throat> So 1 Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. What did he do? What was his example? Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, talking of his crucifixion. It says that in his death and resurrection, we too should live unto righteousness. To do good is following his example. His example was doing no sin. But also, he committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Another version says, but committed himself to God who judges right justly. And this was the life of the Lord Jesus. This was the example that we are expected to follow. The pattern that he has left, that we should follow his steps. What else does it involve then to be doing good? Uh, come to Matthew in chapter 22. These now are Jesus' own words. Uh, in Matthew 22, verse 35, uh, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, what is the great commandment of the law? He was asking him, what have I got to do? What is the great commandment that I should follow? And Jesus responded, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Again, these are similar ideas that we are seeing through the scriptures. Similar words to Deuteronomy. To do good and to follow his examples involves a life of obedience to God. Loving God with all heart, soul and mind. And showing that same love to one another. Called by neighbour. <coughs> On the counter side... We may ask, what, what then is evil? Well, the answer may be obvious. It's anything that is not good. It's the opposite. It may help us to explain our little issue from earlier on perspective of good and evil. To one, something may be viewed as evil, to another less so. In fact, as humans, we tend to see and view evil in, in varying degrees. So again, I'll give you another example. Um, Consider different crimes. For example, we may view murder as being more evil than, say, stealing. Likewise, when considering individuals, like earlier on, we may think of someone like Hitler being more evil than specific, specifically a, an ordinary citizen. <clears throat> and is that not because of the specific actions that a person does and maybe how often they are doing them. Even in society and the laws of the land we see how evil or wickedness can have varying degrees depending on what is done or said. But in the Bible evil in, in terms of actions really consists of that choice that we have been looking at this evening. To follow God, to love God and follow his commandments, or to reject and to serve self. We've already seen how that man naturally is wicked. Sin entered into the world and death by sin in Romans. 
But the Lord Jesus also highlights to us some things which are considered evil. Come to Mark in chapter 7. So in Mark in chapter 7, verse 20, what does Jesus describe as evil then? And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. They are from within. This is what naturally comes out of man. Not all of them, but these are examples of the evil things that can come from within man. These are the evil things. And so, as Jesus overcame and has set an example for us to follow, which we saw earlier, he lived that sinless life. He died and rose so that others may live. Here was one who overcame evil by doing good. Following on from that reference in Romans 5, it goes on to say in Romans, in fact, let's turn to it, Romans in chapter 5. This was our reading from earlier on. So we've already considered Romans 5 and verse 12, but it goes on to say at verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience, that is the work of the Lord Jesus, of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. This links to God's purpose from the beginning. Remember, at the start, when we started turning up the references, we saw it was God who saw his creation and described it as good. Through Adam and Eve, sin entered into the world, that knowledge of good and evil, and that passed on to all men, so that all die. But the Lord Jesus overcame sin. He did know sin. First of Peter chapter 2, and has set an example that others should follow so that they too may overcome this power of evil. This then becomes the challenge to all, for men to strive to overcome evil, our own desires, sin, and serve God by following the perfect example of the Lord Jesus. We have a choice to reject God, his ways, his son's example, or strive to serve and follow him. And the Bible, again, there are a number of references which talk about this idea of overcoming evil. We needn't turn to them. Psalm 34, depart from evil, do good, seek peace and pursue it. Psalm 37, depart from evil, do good and dwell forevermore. Proverbs 3, be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, depart from evil. Romans 12, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And so there are a number of references there which talk about overcoming evil with good. That's the challenge that it's laid out for us, but it's not easy. The Lord Jesus was an exceptional example. He did no sin and committed his life to God. We know that we sin, that we fail. We say things that are incorrect. We often make mistakes. And also we serve ourselves and not God at times. But what is required is that we try to follow what is laid out for us in the Bible. In fact, just to give us a bit of comfort, turn over to Romans in chapter 7. Because the Apostle Paul speaks of his own personal struggles. 
I'm going to read of these. I'm going to read from the ESV here in Romans chapter 7, verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. The Apostle Paul there is talking about the struggle that he faced between that tussle, between doing good and doing evil. And so this really is a challenge to follow the Lord in all that we do. It's a challenge that we must strive to do in our own lives. And so hopefully we have seen what good and evil is and how it is presented within the Bible. Of course, it's only a snapshot. We could only turn up a few references to look at this subject. From God's perspective, it's fairly clear. But as we as men can sometimes skew this view of what good and evil is. We have seen there is a challenge and a choice given to each individual to follow the path of good and the example of the Lord Jesus, or to serve self and follow that path of evil. As Christadelphians, we believe there is a coming judgment on this earth where men and women will be judged according to their actions in their life, whether they have tried to follow the commandments laid out in the Bible or whether they have failed to do so. So come with me to our last reference to finish in Romans and chapter 12. Uh, Romans 2, sorry. Romans chapter 2, commencing at verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour, immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, Jew first and also of the Gentile, but glory, honour and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile.